in general. There's a lot of nudity involved. Kayla is going to talk about it, uh, an extension of this, uh, yeah. a way to keep everything in order in your head, and a little bit of jail medicine. <laughs> um, so I was a nurse at the Madison County Jail. We had anywhere between six. Yeah. We had anywhere between six and seven hundred inmates um, at any given time. There were daily fights, daily all officers, which meant all nurses available calls. Um, and when he, he was like, what do you do if somebody doesn't want you to fix them? I'm like, I'm just going to let them pass out. Eventually, like if they can't breathe, then they're going to pass out and then I'll fix it. If they're bleeding, they're going to pass out and then I'll fix it. So I'm just going to wait because I didn't want to get into any more fist fights than I had to. <laughs> um, but there's just, uh, the biggest thing about medicine is that you are way more likely to save a life than you ever are to have to take one. And like my family like has built a business on teaching people how to defend themselves. And that's just a, a minuscule portion of the good that you can do in a community. Like the saving yourself, saving an innocent versus knowing how to save a life. We've had six, yeah. There's a question and I, I, I failed to mention it. Once you use one of these tour tourniquets for real, don't use them again. So if you buy one, for you, don't buy one of the cheap plastic ones to practice with, but don't do that because they do stretch out. You keep doing that windlass and everything, it stretches out and it'll become ineffective when you really need to use it. So have training ones, mark it as a training one, have ones that are for real. <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, we trained close to 20,000 people for firearm self-defense classes. We've had six, uh, almost 60 students in gunfights. I get that many calls a year, and 85% of our students are fighting pistol alumnus. 1% of our students are medical alumnus. So that, that's the difference in how much more good you can do by knowing how to save a life. It makes you a more useful human in general. And it's my passion, I love it. Um, no glove, no love. Every stranger you come into contact with has some kind of disease that you don't wanna take home to your kids. And so if you are not actively swapping bodily fluids with people on a regular basis, put gloves on before you do medical. Uh, you should carry gloves and a tourniquet every day, everywhere you go. <laughs> So that you don't start trading nasty infections that you can't wash off with Dawn dish soap. Um. I pro too. Yeah, I pro. Stay. The mask, uh, anything to like in the bigger bags. I have all of this other stuff. Um, so I pro to keep fluids from getting in your eyes because any any wet spot on your body is going to be a place that you can get infected. So your eyes, inside your mucous membranes, your nose, uh, your fingertips usually get a lot of cuticle tears and stuff. That's why we wear gloves. And a down and dirty trick that I used at the jail when officers would get uh, into fights bringing inmates in or on the pods, if they don't have gloves on when this happens, so I take alcohol, like the hand sanitizer, run it from here down to here to know whether or not we needed to send them to the ER for prophylactics. <laughs> so, if it burns, if it burns then they have an open wound and yep. the blood could have entered their system. If it doesn't burn, then they don't have to go get put on an HIV medication for 30 days. So, <laughs> they, they like that. Um, mindset above all else. You have to make the decision before something happens on whether or not you're going to get involved in health. So make the, make your peace now. Uh, we talked about having living wills, all of your ducks in a row, so that you can go into these situations, whether or not it's bad guys or car accidents, and be willing to help. And when you have a clear conscience and all your ducks in a row, like it's a lot easier to make those calls. Uh, the order of medicine, self-aid, buddy aid, medic aid, 
than the hospital. So all of this stuff that I have is for me and my family. I will use it on other people if they happen to get hurt before us, but everything I carry is for me and my kids. So people will see stuff in there and like, oh my, you're only a nurse. And I'm like, yep, somebody else might show up and know how to use it. Or I might be willing to take that risk to save my kid. So don't limit yourself to only learning what you think like you're not gonna get in trouble for, like outside Good Samaritan stuff. Like I, I'm not putting myself in that box. I wanna know this stuff for me and my kids. And the entire thing that we're working towards here is to keep the air moving in and out and the blood moving round and round. And if there's any interruption to that system, that's when we're gonna start having problems. So this is just a quick and easy way to keep everything in order. And it's gonna go in order of what's gonna kill you the fastest. And we use an acronym, the five B's. And the, yeah, you can go ahead and write those. Uh, the five B's. The first B is bad guy. And I'm used to teaching this class to a lot of people who are used to carrying or being around guns. So we put, put it in that sense. But the bad guy is whatever is causing you damage. If you've just been in a car accident and you're still in the middle of the interstate, the bad guy are the other cars. So paramedics, EMT, scene safety. That's the first scene safety. CPR, that's the first thing they want you to do is make sure that it is safe for you to proceed. So I tell people, aimed, accurate, deadly fire is medical treatment. Like if somebody's leg, it, like they fall and their leg is stuck in a fire, you're gonna pull their leg out of the fire. So if somebody is shooting or hurting me, stopping them, is medical treatment. So carry a gun and get training with it. <laughs> uh, the next B, bleeding. And we talked about the big arterial bleeds. That is going to kill you faster than any, uh, other than the bad guy. <laughs> That's gonna kill you the fastest next. A minute and a half to three minutes before you start to lose consciousness and bleed out. And how fast can you put that tourniquet on? <laughs> So it takes up to, you can bleed out in a minute and a half, so where do you lose consciousness? So you need to be able to get that tourniquet out and on yourself so that you're awake long enough to take care of everybody. And then some other bleeds, since he, um, everybody feels comfortable with the tourniquets and arterial bleeds and everything like that, correct? Because I don't, I don't want to keep going over the same stuff. Uh, some other bleeds that still require uh, something to be done right then. Um, if somebody is cut or stabbed or opened up in the neck, then you can use an H bandage and wrap it under their arm. So you're still putting... I wish I had an H bandage or any kind of compression bandage. Yeah. Yeah. Other than a handful of tourniquets, like this is all of my actual stuff that we have to use, so I don't want to dip into that. So uh, anything neck to belly button gets a seal, and that's so we don't cause the tension pneumo that he was talking about earlier. So you're putting a seal so air can't be sucked into that. So she's got a wound on this side of her neck. I'm going to cover it up. I'm going to ask her to hold it. Okay. so that blood doesn't keep going. So the seal, is that like an oil emulsion dressing or? Uh, it's a piece of plastic. Okay. 
like anything that's not going to let air through. Um, another thing that works is uh, chest seals, gauze with Vaseline on it, anything that's not going to let air in there. You don't, you don't have, literally, you don't have a chest seal, tegaderm, something like that. Okay. Tape, duct tape. Duct tape works great for medical stuff. Yep. Expired. Yes, yeah. those are incredible. And you can get them for free at your local places a lot, like your local paramedic station, because they're not allowed to keep it on the truck. And every yeah, every medical piece of equipment that you're using commercially has to have an expiration date, even if it's not going to go bad. So go in there and use those. I know Jerry, uh, one of my uh, other instructors that teaches with me, he goes, and his wife, when she was working at the hospital, she'd go, like, offer to go through the supply closet so that she could bring all that stuff home. <laughs> These have expiration dates. Yep. Yeah. You think this is going to expire? No. That's ridiculous. It's not. It, it has to, like, for the FDA. Yep. Yeah. Anything you ever touch is turned to crap. The next weird kind of bleed is amputation because they don't always start bleeding immediately, especially if it comes from a traumatic place. So if somebody gets their arm cut off in a machine and it's a clean cut, it might not do anything for a minute because when our arteries and veins, I talk about them like they're little kids, they get scared, so they retract, pull up, get really tight, and then when they think it's safe to come out and they relax, that's when the bleeding starts and it is an arterial bleed. So if there's an amputation, tourniquet first. And then penetrating wounds. If you have a penetrating wound, you are going to leave it in place. And it's because the thing that did the damage is actually also keeping all of those little bitty blood vessels compressed so that it doesn't bleed as fast. Yep, you're plugging a hole. And I, like you leave it in place unless it's interfering with an airway and if they get like anything up in the airway where it's interfering they need to get to a higher level of care pretty quickly because if they've got airway issues and bleeding issues like they're not doing well so you want they would be at the top of your priority list get them to a higher level of care the next B breathing so we're gonna look listen and feel we talked about the tension pneumothorax that can happen any kind of chest wound if there's an opening you're putting a seal on it because we want to keep the air from the outside from getting inside just because there's not a hole doesn't mean they won't develop this issue so if somebody gets hit with the steering column they get into an accident the airbags don't deploy and they get hit with the steering column and it breaks their ribs and this actually happened to me when I was working at the jail. Um, they brought a Hispanic man in, did not speak any English. He was intoxicated and he was in a car accident, unrestrained, no airbags. They're supposed to call nursing and they did not. So I happened to be walking by and I see this uh, older guy, especially the Hispanic culture, they are a macho, there's a machismo there. He was not complaining, but I, like, I see him he's going, kind of back and forth at the counter. I was like, red flag, <laughs> let's go check on that guy. And I go up there and the cop starts arguing with me. He got cleared at the scene. I was like, where's the paperwork? Well, I don't have any of them to move out of my he's way. Not clear. <laughs> he's, he's not clear to come into my jail. So I uh, <laughs> get a translator up there, unbutton the guy's shirt, and he had flail chest. The only time in my life that I've ever seen it for real. Um, so what happened was when the, the steering wheel hit him, it broke his ribs and every time he took a breath, his ribs did this right here. And they opened all the way out on the bottom right side. And yeah, yeah. So I call 911 because I'm like, this is bad. I, that I only see about this on TV like this. And so I call 911. They try to argue with me about whether or not he's an ambulance because he's walking, he's talking, he's not complaining. And I was like, I don't give a fuck what he's doing. 
that's bad. He needs to be there now. So as soon as he gets to the hospital, they uh, walk in, tell them what I told them. Like, hey, he's got flail chest, pull his shirt open. Oh, shit. Helicopter him out and fly flight him to Memphis. Memphis is really good at dealing with traumatic injuries. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they got a lot of activity. <laughs> so if you get into like a bad, bad way, Memphis Hospital is great. Their triage nurses have to wear uh, body armor in the ambulance bay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so when he got there, he had a punctured lung. Okay. I didn't do anything about it at the jail. There was nothing to seal. He was still breathing fine. So we send him, he got a chest tube, and then it had caused a liver laceration. So he was bleeding out internally. So knowing mechanism of injury, I knew what to look for. Anybody else, like if I hadn't been walking by, he'd have been put in a holding cell, and he'd have bled out internally. Like my captain called me up and actually thanked me and gave me a gift card for saving them the lawsuit. Okay, so it was yeah, it was a five dollar gift card. Like I couldn't even get a whole ass sandwich for five dollars. On the breathing, real quick. It's like I said in an earlier lecture earlier today. It's not rocket science. Are they talking to you? Can they talk to you in a full sentence? Guess what? They're breathing fine. If they've got to stop after a couple words, they're having difficulty breathing. If they can't talk and they're blue, they're not breathing. <laughs> um, so knowing mechanism of injury really impacts how you're going to look at this person. It's really important to know. And it's really easy because like a bleed is a bleed how do we fix a bleed like an arterial bleed how do we fix it tourniquet so how do we fix an airway if it's blocked we unblock it like it doesn't really matter how it got there we know how to fix it but knowing what happened shows you what you need to look for what needs to become your thing the uh if they do we were talking about the tongue falling back earlier Oh, who are you ladies? I will get it. No. <laughs> I will. I've got mine. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody will volunteer for it, I'll sing one in. Right now. Real, real quick, I want to sum up patient assessment. Every single patient in the world, there's three categories that what the patient status is. All right? There's bullshit, no shit, oh shit. No matter what's wrong with them, they're going to fall in one of those three categories. It's the oh shit we got to worry about. The no shit could be bad. The bullshit is just that. So if uh, if somebody isn't breathing and they're on their back, their tongue can easily fall and walk. It. You can also, if there was an, a car accident and any facial trauma, they may not have an open airway. So you may have to, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the picture of the guy who thought he was going to be cute and hold a firework in his mouth. And then it went off and it split his face open. So it completely split. I wish we had it. That was a good picture. But the picture, the picture that you see is of him in the tripod position that he mentioned earlier so that the blood's draining. And there are just holes behind his face because his skin's not there anymore and that's his nose hole so that's how he's transferred it what do we do for that guy we leave him in the tripod position he's breathing <laughs> and we get him to a higher level of care he's an ocean thing <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> 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 hey if people got smarter We'd be out of jobs. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to go over some things that you can do for a blocked airway when it's not something traumatic like that. And then we can talk on if it is more traumatic like that. The first couple of things, if you're not worried about a spinal injury and you've only got one person, two hands, and nothing else to do, you can do what's called a head tilt where you just tilt their head back and a chin lift. And you just grab their chin and 
lift it, like pull it forward a little bit. And you can do it to yourself. You feel like if you just jut your bottom teeth out, it pulls your tongue forward, okay? So if we're worried about a spinal injury, say with a car accident, and you're trying to get in there and you can't move them yet, but you need their airway open, you take, you feel those little notches at the back of your jaw on either side. And we're just gonna push forward. It's a little bit uncomfortable, but if it juts that jaw forward and it doesn't move their spine at all. So if you can hold it and wait for EMS to arrive, it's the least invasive way to maintain an airway. If you can't, then we move on to the other stuff. The nasopharyngeal airway or an NPA, and I have some here. Child size if anybody wants to volunteer and I can show you how to put one in. <laughs> like, um, and then a thing that a lot of people don't think about, safety pins. We sell them in all of the med kits that we put out, uh, the pocket box and the full size box. Because if you've got a couple different people, you can safety pin their tongue to their lip. Oh. I've had both pierced. Oh. First off, it ain't that painful. As long as you go through uh, the middle and you don't hit one of those like blood vessels, you're good. Your mouth heals almost as fast as your eyes, so in two or three days, they're gonna be fine. You volunteer to do an NBA? Okay. So, what do we want to do? This is my nephew, Caleb. <laughs> um, but you can Did you just volunteer? Here you go, boy. Okay. So, a uh, safety pin in the lip, uh, to the, or the tongue to the lip, <laughs> keeps their airway open. Like, is it something that I'm gonna do on a complete stranger? I don't know. We're gonna see how I feel in the moment, whether or not they look like a sewer or a Karen. Um, <laughs> but, if but if it's somebody that I care about, I'm not worried about causing temporary pain or discomfort <laughs> to save their life. And that's, I feel like that's one of the reasons a lot of people don't want to take medical classes is because it causes you to look internally and face your own fear, pain, and death. And because we're talking about, oh, this is what happens when I'm not the Don Juan gunslinger that wins everything. Like it's, it's the stuff that nobody wants to think about. Having to think about your kid being unconscious, your kid being in the back seat in a car accident. And it's why I'm so passionate about medical in general is because I'm I'm a helper. Like I was put on this earth to help people and to be a mom. And yep. that is the only time that I feel like my purpose is fulfilled. It's the only time that I feel happy. So I'm way, way into this stuff. And it, there's a, a saying in medical, do no harm, but it's actually do no harm, N-O, and then do no, are. So we're not, we may have to, like, was, was the tourniquet, was that painful? Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're causing somebody pain. Was it harmful? No. no. So knowing the difference is what allows you to make decisions whether or not you're acting in good faith. Like, knowing the difference between pain and harm. Guys, <coughs> I'm going to tell you right now, you're already becoming your first responder. It's not the end of the world. It's happening now. Hospitals are short staffed. People at EMS are leaving in droves. Leaving everywhere. They shut ambulances down everywhere every day. We are popping smoke. Like, I got so, lost my job or the vaccine. We're popping smoke. Like, you better, right. better learn something. You're going to wait longer. Get help while you can come. Uh, yeah, I'm going to show them really quick. And then, again, if you're not worried about spinal injuries, like, and this can work even if somebody drinks a little too much, if they're uh, running a high fever, they don't feel good. The recovery position that he was talking about earlier, and I, I like, there's a size difference in us, but I can show you a way, it doesn't matter how, like, how much of a discrepancy there is. So I'm gonna roll into that stuff. Okay, if he's completely unconscious, the first thing I'm gonna do is bring his arm up above his head to protect his head when I roll him over. Okay, and then I'm gonna get, put his arm right here, go beside him and start grab his clothes 
just a little bit at a time. I'm not helping her. Use my knees, push forward. <laughs> when I get him, his arm protect his head from hitting the concrete, I'm gonna take this arm, line his palm out, this leg, yeah. right here, hook it. That's gonna keep anything, vomit, or anything like that coming out, blood, keep it coming out. I can yeah, check okay. the back side. You put them face down in there. What's the most people going to do? Feel like I'm smothering, right? Right. You panic. What happens? Pulse rate goes up. Blood pressure goes up. They're no longer they're they're working against themselves to get back for their body to self heal. So you you think of all these things. We want to keep the person calm. That that pulse rate lowers. That blood pressure lowers. Things work better. And then if they do have something more traumatic or they're unconscious in a car and you've got four victims there's two people in the front two people in the back and you can't keep your hands on them then we go to the NPA my nephew has graciously offered to let us do one <laughs> Paper towels before we actually start this. I'll get some. Okay. Fine. Um, Murphy's Law, we y'all have already heard about it. Okay. We want to learn how to do this and learn the techniques to do this at 3 a.m. on the side <laughs> of the road. You're not feeling well, it's raining, and there's high grass. So a couple of the ways that's gonna be. When you're going to open these. I grab the actual MPA itself, the plastic, and rip it apart so that I've got this in my hand. I don't lose it. Children, cover your ears. <laughs> uh, I thought about treat it like a Friday night. Hard, fast, lots of loose. <laughs> like, hesitation hurts with this, so you just want to get in there and get it done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, take... And you can either put it on the plastic or just run it along either side. You want most of your lube to be at the tip of it because their nose is gonna push it back to go for the rest. Okay, you said, show me your rest. Okay. <laughs> the bevel is gonna go towards the middle of their nose. So the cut part is gonna touch the inside of their nose. This was made to go in the right side, but if I need to go in the left side, which is where it was easier for him to get it in, then you just flip them up. So we'll go like this right here. You ready? Mm -hmm. Just a little bit out on your nose. Yeah. Okay, so we start going in like this. We're aiming straight down at the floor behind him. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. That's the left side. Yeah. It didn't work on the right last time. Okay. There, there we go. And then when you start to feel it click, go past it, you can spin it the rest of the way around. Yep. That's not wanting to do that. <laughs> <coughs> so it's gagging him. That means it's in there. Hold up. Right. Close your mouth. <coughs> oh. with the gag. Okay. People start breathe. having that gag reflex. You good? They're, guess so what? They're always protected. Okay. Yeah. So it's working. Uh, this one with the uh, rigid MPAs like this, um, where they they get compressed. I I rotate mine out because when they start, that one's difficult to flip. Just yeah, because it's I've it's been turned. smashed till it's flattened, yeah. till it's flattened, and it's not doing really what I want it to do. So I trade those out when they start to look like that. But I'm gonna. Remember what she's talking about opening stuff, and I talked to you about earlier stage and stuff. It's real hard in your hands. Wow. Got blood or you got, here, you got cute or something all over it. These tape tabs, like I was talking about, they're just longer tear handles that give you a purchase point instead of trying to slip oh, off this plastic. So it's just little things Weird. like that, yeah. right? Something I want to touch on with them. Yeah. She's got a plastic water bottle. Empty full either way. 
Let me just borrow it real quick. One of the crunch ones. That, that was close. So your nose is cartilage. When you put that MPA in, if you've got a semi-conscious person, give them a heads up. It's like, hey, I'm about to put this up your schnoz, and you're going to start hearing this. You give them the heads up first, so they remain a little calm. Where if you start putting one of those sons of bitches up there, and they start hearing this, it's uncomfortable. What do you think is going to happen? Okay. Good <laughs> <laughs> um, so that deals with the blocked airway. What's the other thing that we talked about with your, your airway being open though? What has to be able to move? Lungs. Your lungs. So we talked sealing it, putting the plastic on it so that nothing else gets drawn in, and then paying attention to chest rise and fall. You heard him talking about the tracheal deviation. Um, if you don't do something about it, right then that person will die uh, we had a guy at the jail he had some issues um that feeling like he couldn't breathe shortens the breath i pull him up there terrible lung sounds i call the doctor trying to send him to the hospital the doctor says no I'm like so i put him on medical observation keep watching him overnight he's still got lung sounds up top in uh, both both lungs i'm like okay he's uh had an over 90 oxygen saturation, which is the amount of oxygen each blood cell, red blood cell carries. So we want it to be between 94 and 100. He was in that because his body was really good at compensating. And then I went home, the night shift nurse come in. She got upset because she was not a fan of this inmate, released him from med ops, saying he was fine. She said she, said she heard bad lungs, but I, they're fine. I come back in the next morning, pull him up he sat in the 80s and so we start like looking paying attention like listening to his lungs I don't hear any lung sounds on the right side so the x-ray that was ordered the day before that I was told hey you're not allowed to get that ordered stat I was like fuck it I'm not risking my license so I called and changed the order to a stat they got there within 10 minutes x-rayed him and he had complete like his entire right lung was filled with fluid. And it was so bad that in the x-ray, you could see it wasn't up to his throat yet, but in the x-ray, you could see that bronchial tube deviating to the other side. Guess who else got an ambulance ride? <laughs> and I got to, got to explain to my captains, I'm like, look, I get some passes because I saved you a lawsuit, remember? <laughs> He's gotta go to the ER now. And they get him in there, they drained, it was six or seven liters of fluid out of that, out of his chest cavity. He was only about 110 pounds. He was an elderly man, about 110 pounds, and that's how much fluid they drained. And then they continued to drain it because he had severe pneumonia. Mm. That nurse kept her license. Yes. <laughs> uh, people get into jail nursing for two reasons. One, because I want to help people no matter their color, race, socioeconomic status, and those people are still people. I worked at a county jail. They hadn't even been convicted yet. And I was told multiple times, like, uh, thanks, like, Miss Kayla, you're the only person in here treating me like a human being. And it was heartbreaking. So I, I went into correctional nursing because I wanted to help people that other people didn't care about. And because I had to be backhanders. I'm not the nurse you want, I'm the nurse you need. <laughs> right? So I get told, like, I'm, I was the water and exercise nurse. Like, I told them, like, drinking water and exercising is gonna fix most of the stuff that you're complaining about. We talked about it earlier. I think Neeki will be here presenting tomorrow, right? Where's Patricia? She's apparently sick. Okay, so you'll have to miss out on that. But a healthy diet and plenty of exercise. Uh, diabetics. Quick tip, if you didn't watch my Medical Monday thing, uh, water and exercise will naturally lower your blood sugar. Okay, it naturally lowers it. So they they thought like, I, they're like, I break my arm and you say drink water and exercise, like and split it, but, break, but drinking and water and exercise and will promote healing, so you should still do that. <laughs> and change your socks. Right? Here's some water. If they got socks, half the time they didn't get socks in there. Um, 
but it, it's one of those things like I wanted to help people no matter what was going on. The other kind of nurse that goes into jail or correctional nursing does it because she knows that nobody else cares about them and she can be a bad nurse. And that's what the night shift nurse is. Like, their people are assholes. You've got good people and bad people in every single profession. Um, please don't let the bad ones ruin it for you for my profession. Like, a lot of us out there still care. A lot of us out there don't care your vaccine status. Like, we're gonna take care of you. And a lot of us just want to make you better. So, um, do I have any questions over anything we've hit on so far? Okay, then we'll hit the last two Bs. We'll take about five minutes. And then, yep, Jody. Jody? Can you explain the Friday night thing? <laughs> <laughs> do you want pictures? <laughs> uh, the next B, because bad guys can kill you immediately. Bleeding, a minute and a half, three to four minutes. Breathing, you can go without oxygen for three to five minutes without suffering long-term brain damage. The next B, brain. And there's not a whole lot you can do out in the field besides gauging their level of consciousness. We talked about ASPU earlier. And then something that is specific to classes that I teach, if they start to change levels of consciousness, you wanna disarm them. Because if, the, if, if it is in a violent encounter that this happens, the last thing they remember is fighting for their life. So you take the gun, make like if they come back, like have it accessible when they're alert again and staying alert, that might be when they get home from the hospital, but uh, you're gonna take it so that they don't think that they're fighting you. What did we learn about tourniquets? They hurt. So imagine like fighting for your life, going unconscious and waking up to somebody torturing you, putting a tourniquet same, on. Same thing with this. My policy is if I know I'm dealing with armed individuals, I don't care what's wrong with them, the first thing I do is disarm them and I also take their knives. Knives are way worse. Yeah. Oh, knives are scary. Yeah. So just, it's, it's a tip because you don't know what's wrong initially. They could have an altered level of consciousness. Just get that out of the way, put it out of the way, you know, out of at least arm's reach from them. And then the other thing for a head injury is that if it's superficial, it can be very distracting. Your head and face have a lot of little bitty blood vessels that when it's cut, it looks way scarier than it really is. My first encounter with a bleed at the jail um, was an inmate that was HIV and hep C positive. I had done his intake when he come in a couple months before that. And I get a, an all nursing available call, get down, there's blood everywhere. He had broken the window, took the piece of glass and started sawing into his wrist, his neck, his face, he is bloody. He didn't even have to go to the hospital. It was all superficial, but because he picked places that bleed a lot, it looked horrible. And I get in there and he's like, Miss Kayla, if I'd have known it was you here today, I wouldn't have done this. I don't want to risk you getting this shit. And I'm like, well, <laughs> here we are though. <laughs> I'm telling you, I trusted the inmates more than I trusted the officers. Like, nah, nah. you show people respect and they will respect you back. Um, and then, uh, but he, he was fine. And I'm telling you, like, it, I, I was a baby nurse still. And I go in there and I'm like, <laughs> like, that's a lot of blood. <laughs> and uh, but that those are really the only two things that you can do in the field: pay attention to level of consciousness, and then avoid getting distracted by the amount that they may bleed. And then the last B is body. That's everything else, head to toe, treat as you go, except with toddlers. Start at their feet. Um, but you just you go through and reassess, reassess, reassess. If you have to go back to a different B, like a second car accident happens behind you, you start at the, the bad guy, the thing that caused the injuries, and then you start completely over. If they stop breathing, you go back up to breathing, and then you hit everything after breathing on the way down. When you get to the bottom of the list, you start back up at the top, because people, like, especially kids, they'll hold, 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 and then cliff dive. 
Uh, adults are a little bit more of a gradual usually, but with kids, they will cliff dive off. So you want constant assessment until you can get to a higher level of care. And adults will grad, like she said, gradually they go to the peak, they go down to kids, they're talking to you, a few seconds later they're unconscious and unresponsive. It, it is very unnerving when children have bad things wrong with them. So they can compensate a lot higher and a lot longer with their body and their body systems than what adults do. And so in the context of the survival expo, um, all of these things can still work in an apocalypse because nurses are still going to be around. Paramedics are still going to be around. That underground stuff we were talking about earlier, there's already stuff like that in, that in the making for healthcare professionals. So don't think that just because you won't be at a hospital that these things are death sentences. They're not. Have the stuff that you need to take care of it. And you don't have to use everything in your, you don't have to know how to use everything in your bag. Because if I show up to somebody in here who, who has never done anything medical before today, okay? If I show up to your emergency and you have this bag, do you, you don't know how to use this stuff, but I do. Do you know how many nurses, doctors, <coughs> paramedics, and EMTs don't carry any medical off duty? And they're, they're always like, hey, I'm an EMT, go grab your bag. I don't have it. So then, okay, then get in here and use this stuff. We'll, yeah. we'll take care of you as long as you've got silver and gold. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so I have a story that goes with her saying that having supplies you need, and there's often somebody around who has more medical knowledge. I live on a giant recreational lake, and there is a young man who, at 18 years old, had a water skiing accident where he broke his neck. He's wearing his life jacket. And that man is both alive and not paralyzed today because right as his dad was about to lift him out of the water with a broken neck, a nurse who's a friend of mine was in a boat going by and said stop and yelled his dad down, went and assessed him, figured out he had a broken neck, used a ski to brace him, get him up safely without killing him and without paralyzing him, held his neck in place while they went back to the marina they life flighted him to Vanderbilt, and by a week later, he was able to move his limbs. There's often somebody nearby, and if you have supplies for them and they don't, you're in a much better place. And that, that reminds me of a couple more things. Uh, we talked about in the beginning, you have to be willing. And that means that sometimes you're gonna have to make people uncomfortable, and you're gonna have to hurt. I, I make a joke, like medicine is uncomfortable in general, there's a lot of nudity involved. Like all traumas get naked. Like the more naked you are, the closer to dead you are. So <laughs> I, I really don't want to see you naked. I'm right. doing it to take care of it. Right. So right. Um, like medical can be very uncomfortable. You have to push boundaries. You have to push back on people, especially if they are at all uncooperative with what you want to do for them. But if you know that it's going to save their life, you follow through with it. Um, it's like you were saying, you can improvise. This is a seat call. You gotta mobilize somebody to keep the neck. How many people have the same spot? You can use it for boots on either side of the neck. Like as, uh, our advanced immediate action medical is all about improvising equipment. Duct tape and cardboard yep. to make one. That's what we made my knee splint out of when well, I was located. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and then also like if you're gonna be that person, which that's why you guys are here because you are those kinds of people. Like take charge. And don't be afraid to give people tasks. Because, hey, I need you to go wait by the road and wave the ambulance in. Mm -hmm. I need you to send people away if they're causing an issue. Did you know you really don't need boiling water and sheets to birth a baby? <laughs> <laughs> that was actually started to send the dad away. Busy work. To give the no. dad something to do. <laughs> afterwards. Afterwards. If you ever had delivered a baby, I hate it. It makes a horrible yeah. mess. You want the cleanup, but they were, it was <laughs> go for the water and grab blankets to get the dad out of the oh, midwife's hair. No dad knew how to boil. <laughs> so, so don't be afraid to give people tasks you should make your own 911 call because if somebody else walks up and sees me putting a tourniquet on somebody and that person's screaming stop you're hurting me it might turn into a bad day 
So make your own 911 call and do it as soon as possible. Yes. What information should you give the operator? So what services you need. So your address first and foremost, and then what services you need. So I am at 135 Madden Street. I need an ambulance. Or if somebody's broken, I need police and an ambulance. All 911 calls are recorded from the moment you hit send, not once they pick up. So everything you say on that 911 call can be played in court and is admissible as evidence. So I try to keep 911 stuff short and to the point, but make sure that first off, I get everything I need. And second off, that I'm not trying to lie them into coming in quicker than they need to, because they have families to go home to as well. So I'm not gonna say I just need an ambulance if somebody broke into my house and there was a, a shooting, I also need the police. And I want to tell them if something's still happening so that they don't come in and get ambushed and get caught off guard. Yeah, so is, is it true they're the only ones who can disconnect the 911? So even if you think you're hitting end? For iPhones, I believe. I don't know. I know for iPhones, they, they have to disconnect the call and then your phone cannot be used to make any other calls for like five minutes or so. Like I've had to call 911 a lot, <laughs> and it's always frustrating when it's when it's smaller stuff. Like, hey, I just saw this car accident. Nobody's hurt, but I need police and an ambulance here to, to make sure. And then like my mom will call me, like you didn't answer for five whole minutes. <laughs> like, why? It's so that That's they can call ridiculous. you back and get in touch with you if needed. Yeah, I'll interrupt. Yep. Do you, um, do you all have questions about stuff like cars that you're on? All that you want to play with more tourniquets, whatever. We're, we're going to be around, be more than happy to show you. Speaking okay. of tourniquets, can I get one volunteer? Real, I've got one last thing and then passing it off. One volunteer. I can't. Do it. <laughs> um, excitement is contagious, so be the person you want showing up at your emergency. Like, be confident and ask like for people to do stuff, but you have to temper in the panic. You can panic under the surface all you want, but whenever you're speaking to people, make sure that you're speaking loud enough for them to hear you without yelling and that you are enunciating and saying everything to where the information gets across. So any questions? Okay, I've got a couple of, I've got a big trauma bag that is uh, has that's, that's all the way up to surgical equipment in it, <coughs> down to just a little IFAC, uh, and then the PEDS attachment that I have for, uh, because I have kids that I keep in the car, uh, to show you what I have for emergencies. If y'all wanna come look at that. But that's everything, I hope you guys enjoyed it. <laughs>